Uh, yes, we have here with us uh, from Robert Grubb and Associates, excuse me, Richard Grubb and Associates, uh, Robbie Jones. And uh, many of you know Robbie. He's uh, formerly uh, worked and was head of Historic Nashville, its president for a while. And Robbie's worked with the office on projects uh, for the last two plus decades. So uh, always done good work and we've always had a great relationship with, with Robbie and the different companies he's worked for and we're excited that he was chosen to do the civil rights documentation project uh, their firm was chosen and he's led that effort and uh, for those that you attended uh, the presentation last week it was great to see all that they've uncovered all the hard work they've done and and uh, he's going to talk about that project here today do this correctly. I'm Robbie Jones. A lot, I think I know almost everyone at the table. I've worked with you on various projects over the years. I've lived in Nashville 29 years, almost 30. I think I said 30 last night, but I, I was off by a year. <laughs> but um, worked on many projects over the years, and this is one I've been, I was really eager to hopefully win the project because we're uh, something I'm, a topic I'm very interested in and actually done independent research on but prior to this documenting civil rights sites just on my own as we came across them in other projects. I was already keeping a spreadsheet and a master database of those, which then let, you know, we incorporated into this project out the gate. So um, the Civil Rights Movement Documentation Project, most of you are aware, is funded with a, a National Park Service federal grant. Um, the Historical Commission staff started on this about a year before they hired Richard Grubb and associates to, to come in and help get across the finish line. So a lot of the work was done by Caroline Eller and Claudette Steger. Uh, the research survey work was done in advance as they were able to get started previously as part of the, as part of the match to the project. Metro procurement does not move quickly and um, or uh, quickly so we were ready to go out the gate as soon as we got a contract and notice proceed so we started in january and and really hit the ground running um, working with caroline and claudette, and claudette. Um, so today i'm just going to talk briefly about um, uh, what we've discovered what the results are and then there'll be some time for questions at the end in case you have any so the team as you probably know is Tim, Caroline, and Claude Atwell on Historical Commission, Richard Grubb and Associates, myself, Carolyn Brackett, uh, Sydney Schof, Drew Mahan, and Natalie Bell were on our team to assist in one way or another. Carolyn Brackett and I are the co-authors. We were the co-authors of the Music Row and PDF. At the time, I worked for Carolyn on this one. Carolyn works for me, so we worked together. But um, we have each, she has a, uh, her own independent firm. And so we bring, we assist each other on special projects, and this is a very special project. Sydney is working with me on the Clark uh, Memorial United Methodist Church nomination, which is, comes along with this MPDF. Uh, Claudette wrote a separate nomination for, for First Community Church, which is part of the project. An MPDF has two components, the master document and the National Register nomination that comes along with it. We're doing two with this one. And our advisory committee, which you guys are, I think most of uh, the two of them are sitting at the table, or in the room is Linda Wynn. Uh, Lee Williams at TSU, Jennifer Adebanjo at Fisk, and Carol Busey, who's here, were our advisors. We have a lot more people involved, but these are the official team members. Sandra Parnum, I've worked with you. We've been emailing. I haven't met you. Nice to meet you. She's part of our team. She's been helping out with all the research at Meharry. So um, I don't have to explain to this group why uh, we did this project. Um, why it needed to be told, but sometimes we have to be reminded of why Nashville is so important to the civil rights movement. Um, so as we know, Martin Luther King, who gave this talk at Fisk Memorial Gym, which is still standing on April 12th, 1960, after the Luby bombing, um, was talking about why he came to Nashville to be inspired by the student movement, not necessarily to inspire us. So that's always something we're very proud of, uh, um, a quote they're very proud of. Um, I do want to note that MPDF is a huge document. It's 194 pages long. 150 of that is history. Um, but we couldn't tell the whole story. Nashville's got a very big story. The civil rights movement is um, something that can't be done quickly. So as we came out the gate, Carolyn Eller said, 
we set, our, we set up some guardrails, what we're going to talk about, what we're not going to talk about. And what we decided what needed to be told first is the Nashville student movement and the public accommodations component of the civil rights movement. That was what Nashville was most known for, then the most influential and had the biggest impact. School desegregation, uh, public housing, employment, all those things were also involved here. And those are separate stories that can be told under a separate context by other people. Maybe we will someday. But um, what we focused on is the student movement. We weaved in the other stories as applicable, um, but we focused on that. And so uh, we like this picture because Drew Mahan, our, um, who worked at Metro Archives for almost a decade and scanned over 500,000 photographs, he was very aware of what they had in their collections and had access to it. So he shared a lot of photographs, including both of these, that may not have been previously published or made accessible or even um, they're in the archives ready to be discovered. He was able to find them. And this is a photo of some guys from East Tennessee coming to uh, Nashville to talk to Tennessee legislature and voice their opinions about things. And that bridge is, I believe, the John Robertson Bridge. The courthouse will be just off frame on the left. And so we felt that was uh, spoke a lot about things. And then the photograph on the right is um, that the Greyhound bus station and the um, Trailways bus station, which is basically where Fifth and Broad is now, uh, where the old convention center was located. Those have been long gone, but it's that intersection there. And so the movement um, in Nashville is the sit-ins, the demonstrations, um, and that's the, po the uh, I think the trailways, the post restaurant at the trailways bus station there on the left, the marches down Jefferson Street. These are sort of things we know about, we've heard about, we've read about. We have markers in, in stories and presentations. Um, we wanted to sort of dive into that. And so we have the lions and all the uh, activity on downtown on Church Street and the 5th Street 6 or 5th Avenue 6, 7th, 8th. Um, we like to talk about the Nashville way and how we're not Birmingham and not Selma and not Montgomery and not Memphis and we're a less violent place. But as we got into the research, obviously there is a part of Nashville that we don't like to be reminded of, but we need to be reminded of. Um, there is a fire truck on the lower right doing a demonstration on Church Street across from um, Candyland. Um, and we're like, why do you need a fire truck hooked up to a fire hose during a beautiful sunny day? No buildings are on fire um, during a demonstration. And, you know, it's an act of intimidation to keep people in line and to not get out of line. And we know in Nashville we haven't had any records or indications they actually used fire hoses on demonstrators. And we know in Birmingham they did a couple of years later. But it's the same the same sort of, you know, um, acts of intimidation um, that the city was you know, not being as friendly to the to the demonstrators as we might like to believe. Hundreds were arrested and went to, uh, uh, went to jail and had to go through court cases. Some were beaten, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, when they resisted. And then, of course, it really got violent when they went outside of downtown, the um, the, the opposition to the to the movement. Um, again, it's stories we don't like to be reminded of. We're definitely not Birmingham in that there were 40 or 50 bombings, but we had bombings. And um, upper left is Luby's house. There's Grafta Luby in the middle. Uh, her and Z her husband, C. Alexander, survived because their bedroom is at the back of the building, and that's the only reason they survived. And the bomb went off in the front of the building. On um, the lower left is the Jewish Community Center off West End. Lower right is Hattie Cotton in East Nashville. Upper right is the Big T Restaurant on Jefferson, which is actually still there, hidden behind the, um, what's the building? Woodcuts. Woodwork, yeah, Woodcrafters building. Woodcuts. Woodcuts building right there that Fisk owns right next to Fisk on Jefferson. The core of the Woodcuts building is this building, which was a, a, a very popular sort of soda shop there on Jefferson that was significantly damaged during the 1967 riots on Jefferson Street. So, you know, there's a big story to tell, and this is a part of it. In reaction to the violence and to the uh, resistance, we had what really was made Nashville special, and that was the perfect uh, recipe of uh, the landscape for the movement to come to Nashville was the universities. We have, we are the Athens of the South for a reason. 
We've got four uh, HBCUs or, or the ones who are active, active in the movement, Fisk, Meharry, TSU, and American Baptist. We have Vanderbilt, Scarrett, Peabody, which were also active in the movement. And we often forget that it was an interracial movement that white and black students um, put their lives on the line, um, got arrested, were beaten, and, um, and resisted uh, and, and provided the resistance. But the, um, the students were led by others. They were the foot soldiers. They were led by James Lawson, who trained the students um, in the workshops at First Baptist and at Clark on how to, to become the uh, leaders in the movement with the nonviolent direct action movement. And um, the students that rose to the top were the John Lewis, Bernard Lafayette, Diane Nash, um, Angeline Butler, the, you know, um, James Bevel, the ones who then went on to other places to have a huge impact on the movement. So James Lawson's and his students, the uh, influence went outside Nashville, it started in Nashville, went, uh, went elsewhere to, to the Selmas and Montgomery's and, and other places. Uh, SNCC was founded at Shaw and Raleigh, and the largest group of people that were there were Nashville students. And there was uh, one person said he didn't believe that there would have been a SNCC without the Nashville students who made the trip over the mountain to Raleigh. So the influence was, was there from day one and, and never wavered. The Freedom Rides in 61, Nashville came and Diane Nash and her crew came in when CORE had come to a, you know, stumbled to a stop. They brought in reinforcements. And another person said that not without the Nashville, what was it he said? It was a quote that, um, the, the fire of the Nashville students matched any fire mm -hmm. that happened in Alabama. So it was mm -hmm. like fire matched fire. So I always thought that was a very powerful quote. But the point is, is that they were driven and wouldn't, wouldn't be um, stopped. That's SNCC there in the, uh, in the parking lot at First Baptist, um, I showed in the previous photograph. So we have... Um, all the information, all the research, all the amazing stuff, and Caroline and Claudette could write 14 books with all the things that they discovered. They mined all the archives and went everywhere in person. Here in Nashville, you know, all the universities that have archives and libraries, we did as much as we could online, but fortunately we have amazing archives here in Nashville. And um, I went down to TSLA and did some research. I know Caroline and Claudette were just gone a lot during research. Um, and so all that information has been assimilated into this document, and I'm going to catch up with myself on my notes. So, da, da, da. so it's um, 190 pages, pages in Carolina. I promise I'm wrapping it up. I think I'm up to 193. I'll stop. But um, 150 of that, if that's the context. And again, it's a big story to tell, and I would rather tell the full story than half half of it. And if you have to read a little bit more, you can skim. But um, I know that a lot of people are like, it's too much information, but you know, I don't think that it can be too much. The MPDF, though, is not, uh, in this case, it's, it's modeled after others that have gone before. So it's not a brand new thing. It's not a new concept. So these other places, Birmingham and Van West MTSU started out with an MPDF, sort of set the stage for others to follow. Selma, Detroit, South Carolina, Ohio, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore is brand new. Idaho, which is strange, but Idaho is in a civil rights MPDF. They actually have a story to tell, and but it's a it's the the resistance story from another angle versus the you know um, the pro preservation movement, I mean civil rights movement. So we work. Uh, that's how we put it together, and this is uh, some images from the other places that you're probably familiar with. So, um, excuse me, part of that, once you get all the information put together in a multiple property documentation form, you have to determine property types that the properties that you documented will fall under for being el determined eligible for the National Register. So R3 that we took from others before us, um, we decided when we're most appropriate here were strategy centers, conflict centers, properties associated with prominent people. And um, those will I'll discuss a bit further in the next slides. But it, these properties must demonstrate a connection to those property types, re, uh, retain sufficient character and integrity, and to re retain their sense of time and place, and fall within our period of significance. It was 1942 to 1969. 42, and you can read the document and learn all about it, but it was chosen specifically because that's when Fisk established the Race Relations Institute. It's when um, the Southern Conference for Human Welfare 
uh, relocated their headquarters from Birmingham to Nashville. It's also the year when um, Baynard Rustin was on his way from Louisville, Kentucky to Nashville on a bus, refused to give up his seat at the front of the bus and was um, pulled out of the bus here in Nashville and beaten up, taken to jail, was arrested, and a young district attorney, assistant district attorney named Ben West released him and said, you know, we're so sorry about this and let him go. All that happened in 42. And if you've seen the new movie, Rustin, on Netflix, if you haven't, you should watch it. But he, uh, that story of his uh, in 1942 in Nashville shaped his mm -hmm. worldview for years to come. And he referred back to that story a lot because he was beaten pretty badly. And every time he kind of got down and you know, like, why should I move on? He referred back to Nashville. And, and the event that took place here, that's why he needed to carry on. So Nashville has influenced a lot of people over the years. And if you watched Bernard Rustin, he influenced a lot of people. He's the guy basically, you know, made the March on Washington happen. So Nashville is always there in all the different stories. So strategy centers, I'm not going to read that to you, but these are the types of uh, buildings that would be considered strategy centers. Um, there were 109 um, still standing strategy centers. There are 93 demolished. These are the, what we documented. There, after the survey started, two were demolished during the survey just this year, which if you know Nashville, it's not surprising. It's still depressing and not acceptable, but it is where we, the world that we live in now. Um, one is the Pinnacle Bowling Alley over on off, um, in North Nashville, which is a place where they held uh, rallies and fundraisers and a place where the black community could go after the marches and kind of catch their breath and, and you know, be entertained for a moment. Um, and the other was the President's House at Fisk University, which was demolished um, just not very long ago. We drove by one day and it was there, and the next day it was gone, unfortunately. So... Um, in this photograph, we have Mount Zion on Jefferson Street in the upper left, and WCP on Jefferson Street in the upper right, the Fisk Gymnasium, which so many important things happened there. MLK spoke at least three times. Um, so many people have spoken there over the years. It's very important to the movement, um, and hopefully Fisk will find some funds to uh, repair it because it's in disrepair right now. Howard um, Church on the right is one of my favorite uh, little churches. It's mid-century modern, which they're scattered around town, hiding in plain sight a lot of the time. You don't really notice them. I've lived here almost 30 years and never knew that was there. And one day you're like, oh, my God, it's so cool. So of those, um, we have 31 that we felt like, one correction, the 109 was the total number of buildings, not strategy centers, that we um, discovered. Of the strategy centers, we of those 109, 56 were strategy centers. 31, we feel like, um, are, are listed or could be eligible. Okay. Conflict centers are the ones that get the most attention. That's where the boycotts and the stand-ins and the sit-ins and the, the picket lines and the march routes all took place, the violence, um, the bombings, the vandalization. Mm -hmm. They also include the courtroom legal challenges um, and the city hall where the mayor uh, offices made decisions and the state um, courthouse where legal decisions were made that had an impact on the movement. Um, we documented 34 conflict centers, 21 of which we believe are, are listed or we believe are eligible. And that includes the commonly known arcade, Fifth, Fifth Avenue, Church Street, um, but also places like Dr. Walker's house <clears throat> next to Clark, which will be nominated as part of the uh, nomination we're doing. It, it was um, a, a bomb threat took place there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Dr. Walker was so important to the movement. He was treasurer of the NCLC. Um, he was involved in, in, all the way. He was a quiet leader. He was a modest leader. He didn't talk about himself, and he went in the paper a lot. But the fact that his um, after Luby's house was bombed, that he was on the bomb list, and the cops had to come out and do a 24-7 watch to protect him and his family for a little while meant that he was important to the movement. You don't threaten to bomb people's homes that aren't important. But we'd consider those to, even though the, they were unsuccessful in bombing the house and destroying the house and murdering the, the residents, it's still part of the conflict that tells the story. The house on the right is Luby's house that was rebuilt after it was bombed. And it was built in that way on purpose intentionally because it was, it was a little more bomb proof, bomb persi uh, resistant, because Luby was still worried that he would be bombed again because he didn't stop. He didn't shut up. He didn't stop his uh, civil rights um, advocacy afterwards. And so the real narrow slits that you see there in the big solid brick wall were meant to, um, to deter future attacks. 
Um, we also have the March route and along Jefferson Street. There are March routes all over town, but the one in Jefferson Street had the most marches, the most important of which was the Silent March. There was also the, in 60, there was the Freedom March in 64. There were uh, 40 protest marches when they're building out 40 along Jefferson Street. So we looked real closely at the Jefferson Street March route corridor from TSU all the way to the courthouse. In my opinion, it is eligible for the National Register. There'll be sections that aren't contributing because they're altered. There'll be sections that are contributing because they've retained sufficient integrity to uh, tell the story. Um, I've done a lot of research on March routes. I've documented the March routes in Birmingham, downtown Birmingham for the National Park Service, um, the ones in Frankfort, Kentucky for the Freedom March with MLK. I've researched the ones in Selma and Montgomery in California, New York, Memphis. And so I've actually presented on it at national conferences this summer in Oklahoma, looking at march routes as a linear resource, not the sidewalks where people walked on, but the ground, the whole corridor that tells the, that gives you the sense of place, that tells the story that um, allows us to understand what was going on with that. Along Jefferson Street, you have segments of, that have integrity there across from Club Barron near TSU, where the SNCC office was. Across the street is the Delmar, what was the Delmar Hotel, the little boo building in the center, um, was a Green Book resource. Behind the SNCC building was Luby's house. And you go along Fisk, where the, the riots took place and all the, all the activities next to Fisk. And then um, down from Fisk, you have um, uh, Pleasant Green Baptist Church, which is a, a movement church, and then the WCP down in, down in the horizon, and Clark on the right. So we feel like Clark, um, Jefferson Street is something we're studying much more closely and, and feel like it needs to be recognized, listed, and a lot more work done to, uh, for people to understand how important that corridor is to the civil rights movement in Nashville. Properties of socio-prominent peoples is sort of self-explanatory, all the different people that were involved in the movement that um, played a role where they lived, where they worked, um, th deserved to be recognized. And the upper left is done out at Hayes' home, which Caroline, Caroline Eller has done a lot of research on. It is, right now, it's days are numbered. It's sitting there empty with uh, windows boarded up on the market, and we all know what that means in Nashville. Three tall skinnies will go up in that spot real nicely. The building on the right is Reverend Cope, Copeland's house. It, he was a freedom rider, um, important in the movement. His home is surrounded by tall skinnies. Um, Robert, lower left, is uh, Robert Lillard's house. He was an attorney after his, uh, and a leader of the movement. After his offices were destroyed by the Urban Renewal Project downtown, he moved his practice at home, was working at home way before COVID. But his uh, clients would come visit him at home. A lot of important decisions were made in that house. It's also surrounded by tall skinnies. Um, I'll say that because these properties are very threatened. And um, it's, you'll drive by one day and they're there, and the next they're gone. Historic markers are great and wonderful, but I don't want the city of Nashville just to be a, a, a landscape of historic markers where things used to stand. And the building on the right is um, Coinus Enix's house over in one of the um, black uh, ranch neighborhoods. I think that one's College Hill? College Hill. So we did a lot of work nominating, I mean, documenting those. So how, what does it mean? You guys know what it means when you listen to the National Register. I don't have to tell you that. And what it doesn't mean, these, this is set up for uh, people in the audience on Thursday night and other audiences that may not understand what it means. All the properties on, shown on here are already listed on the National Register. Um, you probably can recognize them as Morris, uh, First Baptist Church, East Nashville, TSU. On the lower left is Capers. In the middle is Pearl. And on the right is Memorial Chapel at Fisk, which, in my opinion, is one of the most important buildings in the whole state of Tennessee. All the people that have spoken there, all the events have taken place there, the things that still happen there. Kamala Harris was just there uh, earlier this year speaking of, um, about civil rights. It's uh, in a very amazing sacred space that I think a lot of people underappreciate. So how will the research be used? Obviously, um, we here in this room know, want to use the information for preservation planning, local landmark designation, public interpretation through do markers and exhibits and books and tours, National Register nominations, which at the end of this project, four buildings will be listed on the National Register, First Community Church, Clark Memorial Church, Clark Memorial's Parsonage, and the Walker House, which is owned by Clark, will, will be listed on the National Register as a result of this project. But we have over 100 more that, um, or close to 100 that are eligible for the National Register that someone will need to take the next step and get those listed. 
Um, we have preservation and restoration projects. We have, you know, a bucket full of things we can do here in Nashville. And um, a scene here is Memphis in the upper left, Greensboro uh, lower left, Birmingham uh, upper right, and I think that's Atlanta in the lower right. Cities that had important roles in the movement that have museums to tell the story. And um, Carol Buse and I have had this conversation and others. And Nashville is a city that doesn't have a museum to tell our story. We have a wonderful room in the public library, which does is important. But we need a place, in my opinion, to tell our full story and about our role as the what I've, I'm not making the word up, but I really want to emphasize is the cradle of the civil rights movement. We're the ones who uh, birthed the leaders of the civil rights movement. And it's an important story. And I think that we know it and a lot of people don't. And I'm hoping this project will help get that out there. So what happens next is that we'll submit this form uh, in PDF. I'm giving it to Carolyn Eller on uh, Wednesday. And then also the Clark nomination, first community nomination. And then Carolyn Eller will kick them to the uh, to the state review board where they'll review it and then it'll go to the Washington DC to the park service for the final review. Um, hopefully next spring we'll be able to have a huge celebration that, that, uh, to celebrate the success of these documents being approved and then move forward with the next steps. I wanted to uh, close with Clark, which is a building I've done a lot of research on for this project. We work closely with um, Demita Chavez and their uh, church council and others. Um, it's just a, a modest little church over near Fisk, but it's, you could write, well, we should write a book about it. The nomination's about 80 pages long. But all the important place, things that took place there, um, most notably the workshops that James Lawson led. He led equally important workshops at First Baptist Church Capitol Hill. The building is gone. We have the building here um, at Clark. The uh, uh, second floor assembly room is still there. You can see James Lawson there in the photograph leading a workshop. That's exactly the same room. I staged the chairs specifically to show the way it was set up. Those are the chairs we discovered. Mm -hmm. We did not know until we staged them. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at the photograph in our hands and looking at the chairs as we staged them. And the church people that were there were like, oh my God. We're all like, oh my God, these are the chairs, <clears throat> not just some chairs. And so those are, I mean, one of those needs to be donated to the Tennessee State Museum, you know, and our museum when we get one, um, to, they're sacred. You know, that's the chairs with Diane Nash and John Lewis and James Bevel and all the others, C.T. Vivian sat and, were, and, and learned to do the things they did, which changed the world. So very, very inspirational uh, room. Uh, well, hopefully all of y'all can get to go in it one day. So anyways, in closing, uh, if you guys haven't yet, you should do our online survey. If you have old, old photographs or know of them, please let us know. We still have an opportunity to get those into the, uh, into the package. And um, I think now I'll take some questions. If you have them. Yes, Sandra. This is so near and dear to me. I am native Nashville, but 1954 baby. So I remember these marches. Mm. Uh, I remember the places and uh, the it's buildings. On. It's on. My question is about restoring, not just restoring, but how do you keep these buildings uh, significant to the owners? I'm, uh, if you haven't talked to Fisk or the Fisk president or whomever uh, about the gymnasium, where is it on their priority <clears throat> list to do whatever? You're right. The president's house was there one day, gone the next. I'm a fist guy. Uh, I know the streets. I know the area. The J.W. The J.W. Fryson building where the NAACP, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's uh, owned still by the Fryson mm -hmm. people or who. But again, uh, communicating with whomever, the owners, if it's something as big as the university, of saying this is a priority, yeah. uh, lobbying for it. Um, how do we do that? I mean, how do you get in? Is it the commission's responsibility to... Well, there's a new president at Fisk. We could have a party <laughs> and well, go talk to her and welcome her, to, welcome to her I'm position. I'm just saying, for this to be on in her mindset yeah. to know this, uh, again, she's not a Fisk guy. She's come out. Of course, she knows the history. But again, to know that tearing down the president's home meant something. Right. Okay. Now, Stephen Wright's home, and yes. he was one of the, the leaders. Um, so again, lobbying... And this is actually part of outreach, and I, and I failed to mention the public engagement was component the of the project. Home or was it Lawson's home? 
which when that was Stephen Wright's, uh, I think the stone fish, there were uh, two fish presidents homes. One of them still standing. And the, um, the one that was torn down was the one on Yeah, I, Yeah, well, I, I remember the Lawson administration. I didn't remember Stephen Wright be, being there. I think someone told me that it may have been built. It was completed in 62. So was he still president in 62? Lawson, actually, I remember him moving in there. So yeah. I don't remember Wright being there before. Yeah, I think it was I, Bill I, I okay. we'll, we'll clarify that. But the point is, is that we, uh, we did do public engagement. Natalie Bell, uh, we hired her to lead that charge. And we did the online survey, which we had over 80 respondents because Natalie Bell was able to work with Fisk University's Alumni Affairs Department and get the, uh, they sent an email to, they were able to send emails to specific classes. So the class of 60, 61, 59, 62, they sent it to those classes and they responded to it um, through the online survey and gave us information where we were able to do follow-up interviews. And so those came in from across the country. So Natalie was able to do uh, several email communications back and forth and got information. But she was able to do 13 uh, in-person or telephone interviews with important people um, who played a part. And I have that list. I'm, I'm, I apologize for mentioning this earlier. I think you guys may interest know it's King Hollins, uh, Vincent Horsley, Kenneth yeah. Peters, Carolyn Lamar Jordan, Betty Taylor Thompson, Bernard Lafayette, Angeline Butler, Troy Merritt, Novella Page, and Robert Churchwell um, Jr. were the ones. The only who reason I, I was questioning that is that my cousin was married to the son of Dr. Lawson, right. who was president. And I, right. that's the reason I'm remembering we'll fix it, it was Lawson as a And not to James Wright. Lawson. Whenever you say Lawson, I'm like, what? I, I'm what? talking what? about. Right. Well, right. his name was James Lawson. As I well. know it's six. <laughs> <laughs> they have different middle the names. The physicist, James Lawson, right. is, is, is the one that I'm speaking of. But we did have success with Fisk in that, in that capacity of getting through to their uh, alumni, to the Fiskites, who responded to the surveys and, and doing the interviews, which was amazing and awesome. Those interviews and the quotes that they provided were um, then added to the documentation that we're doing. They helped guide us to go find other resources and other uh, avenues of things that we maybe didn't know about before. Um, they filled in gaps and blanks and told us things that we assumed, weren't really sure, they were able to confirm and clarify that. So Natalie's work with the interviews was amazing. She also went to community events and, um, and engaged the public, the uh, Juneteenth, the John Lewis March, some um, marker uh, um, unveilings and the uh, Save the Morris event. So she's out and about. And then, um, so that was all built into this. But the Fisk, they were receptive to us. So maybe they were receptive for us to do a follow-up and come do a walk and talk around the campus and talk about the things we learned and why these buildings are important. Chair. I, I was, if I could, I was just going to add to your question and to say, you know, with this new information, some of these sites we knew about in the office, we had already put them in the historic survey. Obviously, applying for this grant, we wanted to find out what else was out there. So now that we have all this new and updated information, we will plan to re-engage. The office will take a lead in that re-engaging with these property owners. And then to answer the question about FISC, we do have a pretty good dialogue. And I just earlier this year met with their facilities director to talk about many of those buildings that we're talking about. And uh, uh, Councilman Taylor grabbed me at the last council meeting just to say he wanted to set up a meeting with the new president to have this discussion very broadly. So we'll, we'll follow up on that. And I was planning as a former faculty member of his to, to try and meet with the uh, new president as well to talk Good. about uh, various buildings on, on the campus. Uh, so, uh, yes. Chair, um, so just piggyback on, on Tim too, because I think you know, you've know you got a good portfolio of what's happening at Fisk. Um, you know, just for the newer, uh, newer commissioners. So I, I represent the Metro Historic Zoning Commission f from the Metro Historic Commission. So we have um, what comes before us are overlays in, in historic district or neighborhood conservation. So, you know, what could happen, right, Tim, is that it could have a historic overlay over the whole campus. Mm -hmm. um, so then there is a bit of a level where the demolition can be either um, prevented 
or halted for a period of time. Um, it is concerning. I mean, Fisk is an amazing campus. We're never going to have anything like that ever again. Um, so I think with engagement to the alumni, and just because both of you are here and can have a voice in that group, that that would be strongly uh, recommended. Tim, are, are you thinking that's probably in the same line? Yeah, it's something we certainly want to put on the table with all of these property owners if they're National Register eligible. I'll add that uh, Ravi did such a great presentation last week, and we had five or six council members there, and Council Member Porterfield and Council Member Suara, both at large, both talked to me and Ravi and want to talk about some additional legislation or precautions we can put in place. And I've yet to reach out to Ann, but we were going to set up a meeting to do that. And there may be something else we can create that provides another level of lease scrutiny. Right. So we'll, we'll talk about that too. And just as an FYI, just because a property is under a national register does not mean it cannot be demo demolition. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have that kind of designation so that you do have some kind of voice for that. But just because it's on the national registry doesn't mean it can't come down. And um, Fisk is Jubilee Hall, as you know, is a national historic landmark, but the entire campus is not. And to me, that's just such a no-brainer that the whole campus should be a National Historic Landmark. And we're actually recommending that as part of another project I'm working on with Metro Water, which is going to impact all of North Nashville. We're recommending that it be elevated in, in its uh, status, National Historic Landmark. And one building, uh, the Morrill Chapel, has already been put on the study list for World Heritage Level, uh, mm -hmm. World Heritage designation as part of the civil rights movement at the international level. That's how important it is. Greg Saul is also on that list at American Baptist. So I hope that we can get across to people that these are at Fisk, they're internationally significant buildings that need all the attention, funding, and care, love, love and care that we can give them. Robbie, I have one question for you. So after all of this is approved by the National Park. Uh, service the, when is this disseminated to the public is it that's carolyn eller's question so part of what what we're doing today with robbie is recording this information so that it, we can publish it on our website so it will be publicly available we're also going to have the national register documentation linked there um, I haven't had a chance to talk with Tim, but I, I gather that we will likely try to make notifications to property owners of all of these identified resources, let them know that we've got this information in hand, and offer them the options of National Register listing, landmark overlays, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that there will be continued conversations as we go through these edits next spring and opportunities to further engage people. Yeah, I mean, we went there for our research and engaged with the staff over there. You mean to have a place to, a repository? Yes, yeah. the uh, MPDF and the documents can be bound and made available to check out. I mean, to, to read or check out there in the library. That's easy to do and turn it into a, a resource where people can actually touch it and feel it, or make it digitized. And there's all sorts of things. You, the National Public Library has uh, digital archives. You can digitize it. So there's all sorts of ways um, to make that available to anyone, easily available to anyone who wants to go look it up. The NPDF ha has an inventory of every single building that we documented with an address and a survey number, if available. So again, it's, um, e it's, we're trying to make it easy for people to go find these places and not make it hard, make it easier. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. like yes thank you I always need assistance um, I know that there is a, um, a system that if a um, overlay has been proposed or any kind of a protection and if it's pending it gets flagged at codes for demolition so that even if it's been filed I mean even if it's not designated yet but it's been filed is there any kind of even before that step that could flag like I'm, I'm just saying Robbie saying you know even in the course of this survey work, buildings were coming down. Is there any, I guess this is a question for Ann, is there any kind of a, um, hey, we're looking at this kind of 
codes. Hey, we're looking at this, you know, we're in contact with the owners. Well, I'll let Ann tag on, but you know, anything that's national register listed or eligible, we can hold up for 90 days demolition. So that's already in place. And we would, because these are now being put on uh, the greater system uh, that Metro uses. As in RE, yeah. Yes, then we would have that ability to hold up demolition and have that kind of discussion. And of course, then they could. Because we be. are in just such a boom. I just feel like it's going to just keep happening. Oh, for sure. And even if the if the new president of Fisk wants to do it, it's like an, if they're privately owned, all it takes is the right developer, frankly, knocking on their door. And so just to add on to what Tim said, there is in the uh, Metro Code a moratorium for proposed historic overlay districts. But that is the limited protection. And. clarify on that when she asked the question is that these buildings specifically in Fisk are they tagged already or not yet I, th I think all the ones I'd have to look at the list thoroughly but I, I would suppose all the ones at Fisk are already tagged so then if somebody came for a demolition on that then zoning would say hey or get come to MHZ MHC and say hey somebody's coming over here to have a permit and we're going to flag it. That's correct. Just if it, it is isn't good. Fisk a, a historic district. It's a district listed on the National Register, but there's no zoning overlays whatsoever. Okay. Yeah, we I knew were, there were no zoning overlays. The Historical Commission but, was able to document the Fisk President's home before demolition in, um, last year. Yeah. So at least we have photographic documentation um, prior to demolition, but I think I'm not sure if that was just a courtesy or not. Uh, it was a courtesy. They weren't willing to hold up demolition, unfortunately. We had a discussion about it, but they weren't willing to do that because of plans uh, at that site for the expansion of the campus. Fisk also demolished a dorm where they're building the new dorm. They demolished a, a historic dorm in Diana State. Closely. So Closely. those kinds of things are yeah. Yeah. sad when you find out we had the dorm for Diana State. We do have the dorm, um, the boy hall, where John Lewis stayed. So we still have that one. Let's flag it, but, you know. Yes. Uh, Robbie, have you had access to the Tennessean photo files? I know no. they're difficult to get into. You have to pay. Those are, you'd pay, yep. but the Nashville banner are all available. Yeah. And uh, usually but they photograph the same things. For example, back in 79, I did the illustration work for John Edgerton for Nashville Faces of Two Centuries. I found one at the Tennessean of a tank at Fifth and Broadway after MLK was assassinated. Mm -hmm. I've seen those photographs, and I think the banner has them too. Okay. Um, so we have, like I said, they usually duped each other's work, so we have access to those photographs. Um, but, but that the, one was particularly scary, a tank on Lower Broadway yeah, yeah. because of the assassination. Yeah, I saw that. They were over at Fisk and TSU yeah. as well. They had, to, um, they had to lock it down. The Getty photographs we, we have for Clark, it's the only photographs known to Those man. are expensive, too. Those are expensive. <laughs> we paid 300 bucks for thumbnails, but we bought them. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Robbie, are, are there procedures where there are government funds I mean, I, I'm thinking of FISC, where there's probably not a lot of excess funding available. Are there outside yes, sources? Yes, right now the Park Service, the National Trust, there are lots of opportunities for funding for HBCUs, African-American projects, civil rights projects. They just have to be pursued. So my question is, will this project then help them develop those kinds yes. of... It should. I mean, yes, it should, right? It should, and they were already doing that. You may not remember, but a year ago, they did apply for one of those grants, specifically for six of the historic buildings on campus, and we signed on to that and were a part of that grant application. Unfortunately, they didn't get the funding for it, but they did apply for it, and for that very reason. Well, that's wonderful, because you indicated that there was a lot of work to be done on the gymnasium, and I... Yes. External so funding them, can help make that happen. And this can help them make a more solid argument about why they deserve the funding. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Robbie, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, wait, I got one more thing. <laughs> Robbie, wait, this, mine's very quick, a very concrete <laughs> question. Uh, on the Antique Road Show this last year, when uh, 
they were here in Nashville, there was a guy who had three of the stools from the uh, Woolworths. Woolworths. from the Walgreens. Yeah, and Woolworths. you've got you've got some at the State Museum, don't you, Jim? Yeah. It'd be nice to have a complete set of them. I'm just saying, I saw it on the TV. That's what <laughs> Did you yeah. buy them? <laughs> well, they, they were, the more, they were beyond my budget. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering. I thought I saw what I saw. Okay. Uh, Thank you, guys. Can I, can I make one quick oh. question? One quick, and then we, we're <laughs> running behind. I guess this is it's a big tomorrow. story. The Clark uh, photos. You said Getty was the only source for the Clark. Just warning about Getty. We had this uh, conversation back and forth because Getty had one of the Meharry pictures. I said, no one gave that to you. Where did you get it? Um, they have a bad habit of getting pictures from HBCUs and posting them without ever checking to say, you all didn't get that from us. How did you get it? So I go back and question Getty mm -hmm. on how did you get that. And I just paid it 300 bucks and said, thank you. I know. <laughs> but yeah, that is a, a good topic for another day. Uh, Robbie, I would like to speak with you briefly afterwards. I had dinner with uh, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson on Friday. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is doing a book on James Lawson. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I need to Can talk we, to yeah. you because he had some, some questions for me. And I'm really interested in your photographs because that's kind of what he's looking at. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.